Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk, giving me the opportunity of uh, talking to you about how Tigergraph, uh, in, in particular, computes against uh, property graphs. But before doing so, I would like to, to add uh, a comment to the previous uh, talk and the discussion afterwards. Um, Tigergraph sits on both the LEBC and the GQL um, uh, committees. And when it comes to syntax, um, yes, G Tiger Graph is offering Open Cipher. It is also offering its own um, language called GSQL, which is heavily modeled after SQL. And it has been significant uh, towards including in the GQL standard um, an uh, alternative syntax to, to Open Cipher, which uh, looks much more like SQL. Second, I would like to point out that uh, the statement that uh, LDBC uh, benchmarks uh, are not audited is not fully correct. As a matter of fact, Tigergraph is the first and at this point only uh, vendor who has uh, um, audited LDBC benchmark results at the highest uh, scale factor, which is uh, 10,000. So we're talking about Terra uh, numbers of nodes and hedges. All right. Today, however, I will not talk about um, about um, uh, syntax much. I will talk about the computation model, which allows one to um, compute in parallel over graphs, and that has allowed, uh, for example, this um, uh, scale up to the LDBC scale factor ten thousand. Um, let me jump in directly with uh, with an example graph uh, in which we have typed uh, data. You may be aware that uh, Tiger Graph has pioneered the, the concept of um, typed graphs um, in which you have, for example, here, a type of product nodes that have name, category, and price information. These would be the properties. Um, as well as customer nodes who have a social security number, a name and address. And these are connected by edges of type bot, which uh, model the relationship between a customer uh, and the product. And uh, such a bot edge carries information itself, such as the discount at, at which this customer bought this product and the quantity of uh, product items. So for example, to model the fact that customer C bought 100 units of product P at a discount of 5%, we would construct an edge such as the one you see on the bottom that leads from uh, uh, node for C to the node for P um, with the corresponding attributes. And visually, I'm going to depict this in uh, our running example as follows. We have the customer and product uh, blobs there standing for the vertex and uh, the callouts tell you what properties these uh, vertices as well as the edge connecting them carry. All right. If I take now the cumulative information on the sales, um, then I will end up with a, a graph such as the one you see here. It's a bipartite graph connecting the blue nodes, which stand for customers, to the red nodes, which stands for products. All right, so how are these queried? The, uh, the underlying mo uh, computation model is an adaptation of the MapReduce paradigm to graphs in order to, um, um, to facilitate parallel processing. And this computation has as a central concept that of the active vertex set. And there is a, a correspondent of the map concept um, in which one applies the same function, the same computation over all the vertices in the active set or over all the edges incident upon this active vertex set. In this uh, map computation, one can also specify what the new active vertex set should be. And finally, the, the uh, analogon to the reduce part of the paradigm constitutes in 
taking the results generated by the map computations and aggregating them together into containers we call accumulators. Okay, so um, the active vertex set is going to be either a singleton vertex, for example, you want to find out all the orders for a particular customer, or it can be a large uh, set of such vertices, for example, all the customers, there is syntax to specify what um, this uh, vertex set should be. There is also syntax for computing such a vertex set. And then when it comes to mapping, um, you can apply the same computation to all active vertices. And that is what we call a vertex map. And you can also apply the computation to all the edges that are incident on these active vertices. And that's what we call an edge map. These uh, computations in conceptually from the programmer's point of view run in parallel. And uh, in terms of implementation, they are implemented as parallel as possible and uh, taking into uh, exploiting the distributed nature of the data. Um, once this uh, map has finished, it will also specify what the next active vertex set is. For example, here we have moved the frontier of active vertices from the customers to the products. And that allows us to chain such map steps um, from this newly active uh, activated set of vertices, we can again continue applying vertex and edge maps. Um, how do we reduce? The computation will generate a bunch of intermediate results, which are going to all be written into these uh, containers called accumulators. And um, uh, an easy mnemonic way to, to think about this uh, entire uh, map reduce uh, computation on the graph is uh, the edge map vertex reduce paradigm. Although this lets, lets out the fact that in principle, you can also map computation over just vertices. How do we reduce? Well, using the, the tiger graph concept of accumulators, which are containers that hold the data value. They accept inputs and they aggregate the inputs into the data value using a binary operation. Um, these accumulators may be built in. They cover the, the usual aggregates one expects, some max, min, etc. also some collection types. You can aggregate into a set or a bag uh, or a, uh, a key value pair, a set of key value pairs, and so on. These can also be user-defined accumulators. There is a mechanism that allows the user to, to implement their own. Accumulators may be global, by which I mean that there is a single container instance for the entire query, or they may be vertex attached, in which case every vertex receives one instance of uh, the container. Okay, so let's look at an example of how, how uh, this um, is used. Um, again, remember our customer product and the relationship between them. I would like to compute, in this case, the revenue both per customer and per product of all the sales out there. So that means that if I zoom in on a single edge, um, I will equip the endpoint vertices with accumulators. Let's call the one at the customer node the C sales accumulator and the one at the product node the P sales accumulator. And then I will compute, notice I uh, in, in an edge map, I can access all the attributes of the edge as well as the uh, endpoint vertices. And from them, I can compute, in this case, the sale revenue for this particular sale. And what I want to do is to then write it into both the revenue for the customer and the revenue for the product. Now, how does this work when, when we work in parallel over all the bought edges? Uh, well, we're going to equip all the vertices with uh, the corresponding accumulators. And then for every edge, 
Okay, starting that is incident on the on the active vertex set. Let's say that in this case it's all the customers. For every such age, we're going to compute that sale revenue and we're going to write the value into the two accumulators. And this happens conceptually in parallel over all the edges. So here the, the question is, how do you avoid one edge's result being overwritten by another edge's result? Well, what I want is to keep their uh, aggregated sum. So I'm going to define this C sales accumulator as a uh, sum accumulator, which just adds up all the values that it's, uh, that get written to it. And similarly, I have here a situation of a product that uh, has two incoming edges from two different customers. And I will again take the revenues and sum them up. All right. So... Just a quick connection to the syntax of uh, Tiger Graph's query language, GSQL. How is the previous computation described uh, at high level? First of all, there will be a declaration of the sum accumulators, C sales and P sales. Um, sum accum tells us that all the values will be summed up. Um, the type here tells us that this is uh, these are going to be uh, floating point values. And the add sign in front tells us that this is a vertex attached accumulator. Had we used a double add sign, that would have told us that we have a single global accumulator, which is not needed in, in this example. Okay, so this is how we define uh, the accumulators. Then the from clause specifies a pattern which can be written in a variety of syntaxes. Uh, G SQL has its own. I'm using here the syntax that uh, the upcoming GQL standard um, is um, supporting. So we're introducing the variable C to bind to a vertex of type customer, variable P binds to a vertex of type product, and B binds to an edge of type bot. And then for every such binding, the accum clause will be evaluated. And here we are introducing a local variable of type float, which is computed from the necessary attributes of the edge and the product involving the quantity, the discount. And then notice here the last two lines in which we write into the accumulator at node C and into the accumulator at node P, the same value that we have just computed in the local variable, the sale revenue. One thing to, uh, to note here is that in this particular case, the active vertex set is implicit. One doesn't really have to say uh, what it is. Here, uh, the, the compiler realizes that we're talking about all the customer vertices. Another thing to uh, observe is that in this style of aggregation, one can compute um, two different aggregations by different criteria. One is by the customer, the other one is by the product um, in a single pass over the same data. And uh, finally, the fact that the groups are distributed, they basically reside in uh, the accumulators at the vertices, every vertex corresponds here to a group key. So we're computing a lot of groups in parallel distributed over the graph. And here would be the syntax in case we wanted to, uh, to generate a new set of active vertices. In this case, we would just select P, P was the product. And all of them would be put together into a set that we call products using the syntax. And that allows us then to chain this kind of select from acume blocks because the next block can now refer to products just like it previously referred to the type of customer vertices. All right. Um, let me point out that some of the benefits of aggregating using accumulators uh, transcend the graph data model. In particular, this way of aggregation subsumes SQL style aggregation. And uh, in GSQL, SQL's group by clause is supported and is really implemented as syntactic sugar based on this kind of accumulation uh, uh, 
um, tasks. Um, the queries are now naturally parallelizable because one can work on the various edges in, in parallel and one can just write to these accumulators. And as long as the underlying binary operation of the accumulator is commutative and associative, it doesn't really matter in what order those, those variables are written. So this allows um, a lot of optimizations and in particular parallel evaluation. And as I've shown you in the previous example, this paradigm also facilitates uh, specification of multi-pass, uh, sorry, single-pass multi-aggregation by different grouping criteria, which, which actually goes beyond what even SQL can do. Uh, SQL only partially supports uh, this. Um, even the most sophisticated aggregation primitives of uh, SQL will result in wasteful aggregation in the sense of forcing us to compute more aggregates than the user actually needs simply because one cannot specify a more refined aggregation task. Um, we have actually performed some experiments showing up to threefold speed up of the accumulator based aggregation over the conventional SQL style aggregation. And we've published those in a Sigma paper three years ago. So with this, I would like to thank you and Take any questions. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, the LDBC TUC Zoom is muted. Uh, thank you. So thanks for the talk. First question. Okay. Uh, I didn't miss the applause. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, question. What happens if you have nulls, right? Because with the accumulator, you seem to follow, would follow the usual semantics when presence of one null would result in the whole aggregate being null, whereas SQL aggregation, of course, just disregards nulls. Very good question. As a matter of fact, the native um, Tiger Graph data model does not have nulls. Um, does not manipulate nulls, and um, in, in the, the initial philosophy was, well, if, if the uh, value is missing, then uh, it's just simply not there. Um, the, um, the accumulator can, of course, be implemented to be null aware and to behave however one likes. SQL style, in which case one null destroys the whole thing, or... Um, or, or not, in which case the, the nulls will be um, simply um, ignored. I apologize, but I cannot quite hear. I can repeat it. The question is, okay. would a null aware accumulator still be associative and commutative? Null aware? Um, Yeah, for 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 those aggregations that behave like SQLs, I guess so, right? Because you would just drop them and it doesn't matter in what order you drop them and you only care about the result at the very end of the computation. Uh, but if I have a version that's supposed to turn null as soon as it sees the first null, then it is possible that in the middle of the computation, depending on the order in which this null appeared, you will have different... Um, snapshots, but you only care about the result at the end. So yeah. All right, there's one more question from Roy. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering in case, and I'm not too familiar with Tiger Graph, but uh, in case the graph is being charted across multiple machines, if you can give some insight about how does the sharding uh, is done in order to reduce network overhead um actually i'm not the the right person to ask to answer that question i was not involved in the in the underlying architecture but yes uh, there is sharding that's all point this is a shared nothing architecture um and i know that uh, just like in the case of map reduce you will have the local computation at the various computing nodes and then there will be um there will be um combination of results as much as possible before sending them over the network. And um, the, a full-fledged um, um, networked implementation 
uh, exists. And this is what uh, Tiger Graph is currently operating in the cloud. Okay, thank you. There is one more question from Molham. <clears throat> Hi, Alan, this is Molham, nice talk. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to map uh, paradigms here. So if I understood correctly, a vertex and its properties, I map to a table with a one column key, and that's the vertex, and all its properties are the rest of the columns, right? They're functionally dependent. You can think of it conceptually that way. They are yeah. not really implemented in tables. Sure, sure. And and then an edge is just a table with a two-column key and or maybe a set of tables with two-column keys that map to each of the properties as well, right? You can think of that that way, yeah. Yeah. So then in this example, you're kind of going lower level uh, because you're exposing things at the level of how to aggregate locally and exchange information than you would in SQL. So maybe this isn't the best motivation, motivating example for graphs, but you know, adding uh, what, what I find compelling about your example is the last point here on the slide that you can do everything in one pass, but also a sophisticated query optimizer should be able to detect that you have a, uh, an aggregate with a common body and just sort of compute things in, uh, in one pass. Um, and the advantage of the other model is you can have a hyper edge. So you can have three columns key and have three vertices connected to each other in an edge or a four column key. And you can add as many properties as you want in the non key columns of the table or uh, and so on. So I'm just, just trying to do the mapping here. This, I think in SQL, this example would be actually easier for the user because all the parallelization concerns would be, you know, uh, under the covers, you know, the C's. this would be sort of an embarrassingly parallel set of queries to optimize, no? Maybe. Let, let me point out two things. First of all, um, there is a much more SQLized uh, syntactic sugar that one can use in GSQL in which we don't make the accumulators visible at all. And we just write things as if they were yeah, tables that you join and you group by and aggregate. And the compiler underneath knows how to translate to what you're showing, what I'm showing here. The reason I'm showing this here is because this was a talk about the model of computation underlying, not, not the syntax. So there is syntactic sugar that makes it look just like SQL. That's number one. Number two, there are quite a few applications where you actually, if you want to be uh, efficient, you may want to to hide to to open that abstraction and and manipulate these accumulators explicitly. And even here, uh, I would actually challenge you to write this in SQL without writing two query blocks. Um, and once you have two query blocks, one that grows by pro product and one that grows by customer, I agree with you that the good compiler should be able to call, to look at the two query blocks and across them, realize it could have done a multi-pass. I challenge you to find uh, one SQL engine that does it. Okay. Now, relational AI, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it, it goes beyond what uh, typical SQL optimizers do, but take any SQL vendor, they will not do it. I agree with you on that. I, I have to agree that sort of the default uh, in OLAP optimizations uh, don't seem don't seem to do that. Maybe uh, DuckDB will do that for us. Uh, okay. No, I just wanted to compare paradigms. Thank you very much, John. Thanks.